Welcome to our Wednesday evening midweek Bible study for the night of April 29th, 2020. Just a few announcements as well following our Bible study tonight. If you're able to, if you're watching this live at 7 o'clock, we'll be having our prayer meeting at 7.30 following this Bible study. Our Ladies of Grace will have their uh, fellowship and Bible study tomorrow night, Thursday at 6.30, if you can join them for that. A couple reminders about our weekend schedule as well. On Sunday morning at 10.15, we will have our Grace Kids Sunday School, and that will be posted on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And that'll be at 10.15. Then after that, at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we will have our online services starting at 11 o'clock at GBBC Online, Facebook, YouTube, and also on our church website at gracebiblebaptistbath.org. So if you'd like to join us for this um, Sunday services for Sunday school for the kids and Sunday morning, um, those are where you can find us in um, join in with us this Sunday. The Sunday evening, we'll also be having our Bible study at 6 o'clock. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Those of you that are uh, tuning in to watching this now, you'll already be used to this type of format. Basically, what we're going to do is basically replicate what we're doing tonight for Wednesday night for our Sunday evenings as well. So that we have it, um, we will have the Lesson online, just like this, the video will be up at 6 o'clock on Sunday, but then we will have a Zoom meeting following that around 6.30 so that we can kind of go over, answer any questions, and have a little bit of feedback um, related to our Sunday evening Bible study. I, I know I've mentioned it, and I've heard from other people how much they really miss the interaction um, during the Bible study time, so we're going to try to incorporate that as best we can and then maybe consider not this Sunday, but maybe the Sunday afterwards, maybe only doing everything live at 6 o'clock uh, through Zoom, going through the Bible study and interacting as, as normally as we can, as we would for our regular Sunday evening service, where there's a lot of feedback and discussion time. So if you can be a part of that, um, we would encourage you to, be, to do so. But tonight we'll be in our continuing our Bible study through the book of James. And I hope you've been getting... A lot out of this series we've basically entitled Digging Deeper into James. And if you've been with us for the, the further duration, going back a few months, we have went through um, the book of James, not quite verse by verse, but basically thought by thought. So basically one or two key themes for each chapter. We went through and broke that down um, a couple months ago. And then for the past, well, this is the 10th week. The tenth week, the past 10 weeks we've been going through and identifying the series of tests that James reveals to us that reveal spiritual maturity and, should, and test your spiritual growth. And today we're going to be on the 10th test, which is the test of prayerfulness. So if you have your PDF file with you, I, I emailed out to everybody that we have your email address on file. You got your, your PDF. I would encourage you to go ahead and get that out. Get a uh, pen if you like to take notes. And also if you want to find James chapter 5 in your Bibles, Last week, we studied just verse 12. We focused in on just one single verse. But tonight, we're going to finish um, chapter 5, at least our study of it, as we look through um, verses 13 through 18. And once again, just as a summary of what we've been looking at here, is that there are a number of ways that the book of James can be broken up into different criteria and content. And the way we've been doing it is by looking at it as a series of tests that measure a person's faith and spiritual growth. And tonight we'll be looking at the 10th one of these tests, which is the test of prayerfulness. So we'll start reading in verse 13 and read down through verse 18. In verse 13 it says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man, of subject, um, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much 
for this time to meet together and to study your word. Lord, I pray that you will give us insight and you'll give us direction. You'll guide us as we try to glean and, and grasp truths from your word as best we can. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to uh, draw closer to you from our time in your word. Lord, as we consider this test of prayerfulness, I pray that we'll all develop a much more stronger prayer life, more effective prayer life, as we try to grow in our spiritual walk and our maturity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you look here at your outline, if you have that in front of you, you'll see here that we have this broken up into six different steps or six different um, content areas that we're going to discuss these few verses in. And the first three are all related to issue and instruction. In verses 13 and 14, we see one issue that James addresses, and then we see the instruction or the advice that he gives. So we see there's a situation that's occurring, and then the advice that correlates with that given situation. And the first, the first um, issue that we see in verse 13 is this issue of affliction. In verse 13 it says, Is any among you afflicted? Now that word afflicted, we have kind of broken down in a couple ways and defined on our outline as being suffering. Okay, by and large, if we're going to talk about affliction, if we're going to brainstorm a group of ideas and say, hey, we got a whiteboard here, what, what words come to mind? How would you describe to somebody else what the word afflicted means if they're not familiar with that term? And it would not take us very long to come up with that idea of suffering. And it goes on, we see adversity, anguish, hardship. So we see here in verse 13, is any among you afflicted? James is asking, is any among you going through adversity? Is any among you in any type of physical, emotional, or spiritual anguish? In your spiritual life, are you going through any type of hardship to which we would all raise our hands and said, yes, I am. If we're going to be honest, we are all going through some area of affliction in our lives. Now, hopefully you're not going through every running the gamut of affliction in all different areas because that can be very difficult. But there are people who are going through financial difficulties, physical adversity, emotional problems, and spiritual trouble that they're afflicted with at this time. But on the other hand, even if you say, you know what, I'm feeling pretty healthy, physically I'm doing okay. Um, emotionally, I'm doing okay. Spiritually, I'm doing okay. But there's some area of my life where I'm afflicted in some way. If we see the second, um, second illustration here, it could be a difficulty or discomfort. Now, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, okay, we, we can go ahead and just get this out of the way and say, no matter how good everything else in my life is going, is going right now, there's one area that I'm, that I'm struggling with. There's an area of my life, there's a particular need that I have that's difficult. There's some area of my life that is not progressing, not going the way that I hope it would. And James says here that this is the issue. If any among you are is afflicted, Okay, and the, the, James here poses it as a question. Is any among, are any among you afflicted? And to which we would just say, yes, we are afflicted. We're going through hardship. We're going through turmoil. And then we see the instruction that he gives is to pray. The issue is affliction. If there's any hardship, and then the advice that he gives is to pray. One of the commentaries that I came across had just a little quick sentence that I thought was really interesting and summed up this verse of scripture here, and I include it on your outline. It says, the antidote to suffering is seeking God's comfort through prayer. Now, going back to this idea here of affliction, James points out here, says, look, whatever type of affliction you're going through, emotional, spiritual, physical, whatever the case is, financial, whatever hardship you're going through, no matter how you are afflicted, the answer, the advice, the instruction is the same, which is to pray. And we see a few of these verses outlined for us earlier in the Bible that talk about the comfort that we get through praying to God. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the, fright, the righteous to be moved. Jonah 2, 7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. So you see here with Jonah, when he was afflicted, when he was suffering, he remembered the Lord, which prompted him to pray. Next, we see Philippians 4, 6. And typically on Wednesday nights, if we're here meeting in person, we pass around our prayer list where we write down um, all of our prayer requests for the evening before we go to the Lord corporately in prayer. And this is the verse that we have on top. 
Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So we see here the Old Testament, the New Testament, here in James's letter, that the repeated process here of when there's an issue in our lives, regardless of what the issue is, the instruction is typically pray about it. That's where we, first and foremost, where we get our comfort and we get some sense of reprieve and encouragement is through our communion with God. The next issue we see in verse 13 is a, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, which is if you are merry. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So we see here the, the issue first of, of being um, being afflicted, now we see the, the issue or the situation of being merry. And then we see here, just as James gives us the, um, the instruction of what we should do when we are afflicted, we see there's also an instruction of what should follow in our lives if we're merry. So we see here the, the, the term merry there can be equated with being glad, cheerful, or joyous. Very simply, if you are merry, it means that you are happy or full of hope, very hopeful. And we see in Proverbs 15, verse 13, that these are important aspects of our life as believers. It tells us that a merry heart maketh a, cheer a cheerful countenance. So if you are merry, you are happy, you are cheerful. Proverbs 15, 15, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Proverbs 27, 22, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And we see here, so if you, if you are merry, if that's your situation, if that's the, your, the, the situation where you find yourself, then we see the instruction is to sing. Now, we're going to tie this in in just a second, but we see here that the natural response of a joyful heart is to sing praise to God. And we see this even in our own lives. If somebody is kind of walking around that's always kind of humming or singing a song, we, we get the, t the sense there that they are at peace. There's something in their life that, it, that is going on that reflects that they are actually cheerful and hopeful and living in happiness. And we see here in, in a few of the verses that, in, that back this up and that support this claim that when we are happy and they're joyful, there should be, that should be evidenced by singing. And Job chapter 35, verse 10 says, Where is God my maker who giveth songs? In the night, so we see here that God gives you that song that we sing, and that's something we should be very thankful for and, and be very cheerful about. Psalm chapter forty, verse three: He hath put a new song in my mouth. One one thing we see is that God gives us the ability to maintain our happiness, maintain our joy in the midst of our trials, and we're going to touch on that. In, like I said, in just a second, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a couple of points I want to make, but I'm going to try to stick to the outline so that I don't get get you confused as you try to follow along. Psalm chapter 33, verse 3, Sing unto him a new song. Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Now, what we see here, if we go back to this, is going back to the issue of being afflicted. James says, look, if you're afflicted, the instruction that he gives is to pray. So the, the very natural application is, if you're afflicted right now, which we all are, we, we talked about that, we're all going through some sort of hardship, some sort of trial right now. The instruction here that we have to ask ourselves, if we've applied this, is have you really prayed about it? Because what happens sometimes, if, if you've been here for Wednesday nights and for our prayer meetings, typically you'll know that what, what tends to fill up the content of our prayer list tends to be the physical needs. And that, that's great. We should definitely pray about physical needs and ailments, people that are hurting, people that are struggling, people that are sick, people that are recovering, that need a healing touch from the Lord. We should pray about those things. But what happens is oftentimes when we pray for ourselves or we pray for other people, we have a tendency to pray first and foremost just for their physical, need, for their physical needs and to omit the other affliction that they might be going through. In your own life, if you're going to do inventory and say, you know what, yeah, I, maybe you are afflicted physically. But what else is there in your life that you are afflicted by, that you are um, facing adversity in, spiritually, emotionally, spirit, or whatever the case may be? The issue is, are you praying about it? Because first and foremost, James says that the answer to those issues is prayer. The, the, 
the instruction that he gives for all of those issues is prayer. And next, we also see if you're married, if you're happy, if things are going well in your life, then what should follow that is the instruction of singing. Now, I know this might not come naturally to a lot of people, um, but we see here that James says, look, if you're happy, if you're cheerful, if you are merry, sing about it. And now this doesn't mean that you have to necessarily stand up and sing a solo in church or you've got to belt it out loud in the middle of everybody and draw attention to yourself. But I would encourage you that when you are alone in your quiet time with the Lord, when you pray with the Lord, spend some time singing to him. I would, if there's one word of a warning that I would give you about when you go into your, your prayer closet, so to speak, and I would encourage you when you do pray, it, it is biblical to find it a place where you are completely separate from everybody else, when you're separate from all the other distractions, anything that can hinder your communion with the Lord. Spend some time, not just going through your prayer list or your long laundry list of needs that you need to pray about. Spend some time preparing your heart to pray by worshiping and praying to God. Um, it, it, you, you would probably be surprised of how differently you pray when you, and how differently your time in prayer, how you'd probably be surprised how effective your prayer, how much more effective your prayers are when you spend some time first praying to, praising God before you pray to God. And James says, look, if, there's a, if you have a merry heart, pray. Pray to him. So I would encourage you to get alone with the Lord Sing songs to him. Find, find some songs that really that you can sing to him that maybe uh, relate to what you're going through and really try to capture how, you're, how you are, um, how God is blessing in your particular life that you want to convey your praise and your worship to him in those ways. So we see the, the issue and the instruction of being afflicted and being merry to the instructions of um, praying and then singing. And the next issue that we see is in verse 14, sickness. Is any sick? Among you. Now, that word sick, once again, is not only referring to the physical sickness or the medical needs that we tend to associate it with, but really, if we're going to read it in, in context and take it back to the, uh, the original language here, um, most of the commentaries that I've come across say that this refers to not only being physically ill, but also those who have been weakened by their suffering. So again, we, if we're going to tie this back into verse 13, we see it's a, a hardship that's not only related to the physical, but could also be the emotional or spiritual hardship or ter turmoil that, that people may be going through. And we see that the instruction here, there's actually three different instructions for those who are going through sick, who are sick. In verse 14, it says, Let him call unto the elders of the church and let them pray Excuse me, let, them, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So we see here in verse 14, the issue is sickness. Okay, not only physically ill, but those who are weakened by their suffering. And then the instruction here it, for those who have the issue of being sick is to call, pray, and anoint. So if you notice here, the, note the order in which James specifies that these should be done. Call pray, and anoint. Now, notice here, most people, when they read this verse, they focus on the last part here, which is the anointing part. But if we do that, we skip over very two important things that take place first before the anointing ever even comes into picture, which is first, calling and praying. So first, I want to talk just for a minute about this, the idea of, anoint, of anointing of someone being anointed in the process here that we see biblically of what should take place first. First and foremost, it says here, it uses that word call, which is to request. In verse 14, it says, Any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Now notice also what the, how this calling takes place. It says, let him call for the elders of the church. So biblically speaking, if we're going to read this within context, the the process that's given is that if anointing is to take place, it should be initiated by the person who needs the anointing or is requesting the anointing. Now, as a pastor, I've had the, um, the opportunity and the blessing to anoint people before. But the issue is, biblically speaking, it's not the pastor's... I, I don't know the right way to say this. It's not, it shouldn't be up to the pastor to call you and say, hey, would you like me to come anoint you? 
or hey, I see you're suffering physically. Why, have you considered anointing? If we see here, biblically speaking, it, it's really the onus is on the person who is going through some sort of suffering to make that decision for themselves and then request the elders of the church. So we see the first thing is to call. Second is to pray. Okay, so before somebody, if, if, if I am in a situation where I would want an elder or um, my pastor or a deacon or somebody from my church leadership to come perform a, a anointing of me, I first would need to call them, initiate that myself, but then also let them pray over me. Okay, so they shouldn't just come in and say, call somebody up and say, hey, I'm going through this problem. Can you come over and anoint me? They shouldn't just come in and just say, here, we're do, here to do the anointing. Let's get right to that. No, there should be a, a prayer over what the actual affliction is first um, before we get to the, uh, the process of anointing. And then finally, we see anointing. Anointing is very simply using oil and applying that to typically um, someone's forehead as a symbol of the covering of the Holy Spirit, um, as we see symbolically in the church and asking the Lord's blessing and healing of whatever affliction that they are praying about. So why does this matter? Well, because the, the once again, the sequence matters immensely in our day and time because this is a process which has really been taken out of context and has caused a lot of confusion. Uh, typically, you sometimes when you hear of anointing, you might associate it with people on TV who say, you know, they'll, you know, call this number and they'll send you an anoint, they'll send, they'll send you a cloth and you anoint yourself. Um, you know, they'll they'll mail you this prayer cloth that they've poured oil on and you anoint yourself. Um, and biblically speaking, that's not correct. That that's not the way this should be done. It says the call for the elders of the church. If we see here, the, the person, the, the, there's a relationship that should take place between you and the person who is doing the anointing. Okay, so um, this is why the local church, why I'm such a big proponent of the local for church, not just because that um, I'm a pastor of a local church, but because we are here to care for one another. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with listening to preaching on TV or on the radio. And in fact, there are some people that I listen to online or I listen to, um, you know, on, on TV. If they have TV programs, I'll, I'll download their podcasts and preaching sermons. There are some pastors that are a great benefit for me. But the truth of the matter is, is when you are in your time of need and you need somebody to pray for that you can contact directly, you're not calling brother so-and-so that you read a book about. You're not calling pastor so-and-so that you heard on the radio and, and you're, you need to have a, a local connection to a pastor and church leadership and elders in your church who can come and care for you and, to, and we see here that you can actually call in your time of need now this idea we're going to see here as we go through this is something that james repeats on um, as we go forward because we see first be able to call somebody and secondly have them pray over you now once again, there are some great preachers that you can get a lot of benefit from. And they might be, you know, and I, you, you sure can grow from them um, spiritually by listening to how they um, exposit Scripture and see how that applies to your life and explain things that maybe you don't understand. That's, those are all good. That's great. But the issue is most of the people that you see on TV or podcasts are these great communicators, taking nothing away from their communication, but they don't know you. They, you don't have them in your phone. You, you probably can't text them or call them and say, hey, can you come pray with me? Now, if you do, if you have a direct line to some of those people, by all means, have as many people, God-fearing people, praying for you as possible, by all means. But we see here, in the moment of need, in your moment of when you're going back to your moment of when you're afflicted, it's important for you to be connected to a local body of other believers that you can call on specifically for the purpose of prayer. Now, this is very timely, thinking about, in just a few minutes, we're going to have our prayer meeting. But we also see the, the process here of why anointing goes through calling, praying, and then anointing. This idea that you can just call somebody up that you saw um, on the TV and they're going to send you some prayer cloth that you can anoint yourself with, that's not biblical. First and foremost, um, that's not the type of call they're talking about. They're not talking about call this 1-800 number. It's saying call for them, make a personal request for them to come visit you and spend time with you is 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 face to face secondly have them pray over you specifically and personally okay if you call a number and get some sort of um you know i don't even know i've never called the numbers but if they send you something to instruct you to anoint yourself 
at, at best, they might have a, a telephone number and a first name that they're praying over. They don't know your specific need. Um, they can't pray for you as individually, as, as personally, um, as we see biblically laid out here. And typically it says, when it comes to anointing, you, you're not supposed to anoint yourself. It says to have them anoint you. And even as a pastor of the church, even someone who, who's in church leadership, if I'm in a situation where um, I would request um, anointing for a physical need, or uh, once again, this isn't only a physical need. We associate this mostly with uh, physical anointing when people need a, um, a medical type of healing. But, you know, this can, anointing is not only restricted to physical needs. This could be an emotional um, or, or, or a spiritual anointing that could be, take place as well. But if there's something in my own life, even if I, even though I am considered, you know, leadership or an elder of the church, I'm not in a position to where, biblically, I should not just be anointing myself. I should be calling on other people from my local assembly, people who can hold me accountable, people who I can reach out to and say, hey, I have this need, physical, spiritual, or otherwise. Will you come pray over me? I'll call them. Will you pray over me? And will you anoint me? And that, that, that's a process we see here biblically that should take place. So we see here that the issues and, and instructions taking place in verses 13 and 14. And then we see a shift, which really ties into our concept here of the test of prayerfulness, which we see the particular prayer. Now, verse 15, we see here that not all prayers are equal in power and effectiveness. And we see that there's a certain type of prayer. There's a key to prayer. There's a, that unlocks the potential of prayer, we see in verse 15. It says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So we see here that there's a key here to unlocking powerful prayer, and the particular type of prayer that God responds to in that way is the prayer of faith. We see this in verse 15. It says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick. This means that only the prayer of faith will have people delivered from their suffering. Um, and it goes on and says, If he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now this is something here, we, I want to pause for a second, because this is the type of verse that often gets taken out of context. And it's something that oftentimes people are just, they have not been um, saved for very long. They haven't, maybe they're reading the Bible through the first time on their own, and they come across this passage of scripture, and they don't quite understand what it means. Or worse, Maybe they've been saved for some length of time and they've been um, deceived or, or misled by somebody else who has led them the wrong way into interpreting the scripture. This does not mean that an elder or a pastor who comes over to you and, and prays over you and anoints you is in a position to forgive you of your sins. That's not what this verse is saying. If they have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. They, this is, they, on our outline, he says this is not related to the elders forgiving you of your sins since God alone can do that. Okay, so we see the, 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 the main point that we see from verse 15 is the prayer of faith. Okay, just as the prayer of faith is the only type of faith that can forgive you of your sins. When you ask God to, to save you and to forgive you of your sins, if you don't really believe it, if you don't ask in faith, you're not really saved. If you don't really believe that Jesus did die for your sins and that he's able to forgive you of your sins, you haven't been forgiven of your sins. You have to ask in faith, as James says earlier, nothing wavering. Okay, so we see here, not all prayers are, effect or is, are equal in their power and their effectiveness. It says here, in verse 15, the prayer of faith is what, that, that, that prayer, key, I'm stumbling over my words, I'm sorry. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to powerful prayer. So if you are in a position where maybe you've been praying you know, throughout your life, if you're on a Wednesday night for getting ready for prayer meeting, odds are you probably have been praying throughout most of your life. But if you're going to be honest and say, you know what, I've been praying for a long time, but I don't see much prayer. Or I'm sorry, I don't see much power. I don't see much effectiveness of my prayer. I don't see my prayers being answered the way that they should. Um, one quote that, again, I had a, a, I've been very blessed. I, I count my blessings every night. And I, I think there's some people that I thank the Lord for every single night for allowing me to sit under and learn from throughout my life. Um, my grandfather, uh, Pastor James Hall, is one that I, for the first 18 years or so of my life, I sat under his preaching. And then when I left here in college, I was under Pastor Roger Eimers and, and um, Pastor Emke up when I was at Fredonia. When I was in Virginia, I, Pastor uh, Ken Overby, and then Maryland with um, Pastor Mel Brindley and, the, and Dr. John Sarrigan. And then the past eight years before I came down here to Bath, I was under Pastor Art Cole. 
And Pastor Cole, he had these quotes that just kind of stuck with me. And they weren't ones that he made a point of emphasizing. They're just things that he stuck with, that he said, and they just like jumped out at me. And I wrote down and remembered them. And he said one time that he's more surprised by prayers when prayers aren't answered than when his prayers are answered. And that really stuck out to me because as Christians, we, we should be praying to God, expecting him to actually answer our prayers. And we see here that the key is praying in faith. So if you are praying, but you don't see much power associated with your prayers, you don't see them being answered very often, I would ask you to consider, are you praying in faith? Are you praying with anticipatory um, expectancy that God is actually going to answer your prayers? Because if you're praying, just kind of going through the motions and saying, you know, well, I'd like you to do this, but I don't know if it's going to happen. You know what? It's not going to happen. It says here, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall raise you up. The prayer of faith uh, leads to forgiveness of sins. So we see here the, the particular type of prayer of faith is what really sets things apart. And then finally we see um, throughout verse, the end of the chapter here, our, our last few verses, we see um, examples and effectiveness and encouragement. And we see here the example that he gives in verse 17 of Elijah. Okay, Verse 17 says Elias, which is a, a reference to Elijah. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So we see here that the, the example he's given of Elijah that we can draw from. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, it says, um, this is referenced as well, where it says, I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. So we see here the example of, of Elijah, and we see that the reason why he, the, how effective his, his prayer were was because it, it says here that it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So Elijah was someone who prayed, and his prayers were actually effective in closing heaven for three and a half years so it did not rain upon the land. And we see here, again, going back to the particular type of prayer. We saw the, the importance of faith, but we also see the fervent prayer. Okay, at the end of verse 16, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we see we need, to ask in, we need to ask in faith, and we need to ask with fervency, with some sense of urgency and expectancy. Um, and then we see here um, the encouragement. Okay, It says here that Elijah was subject to like passions as we are. And what that simply means is that Elijah was very much like we are. He wasn't, you know, this superhero type of person who had a, a special access to God that we don't have. We have the same access to him. The, the, the issue is he prayed faithfully and he prayed fervently. Now we're going to see that, as it says here in verses 17 and 18, more examples of that. In verse 17 it says that he prayed fervently earnestly. So we see there again, once again, the idea of praying fervently, praying with urgency, praying with expectancy. And then we also see in verse 18, it says, he prayed again. And, it and the heaven gave rain, and the earth br brought forth her fruit. So we see here the effectiveness of Elijah's prayers that God responded by closing heaven and not allowing it to rain for three and a half years. And then when Elijah prayed again, God opened heaven and allowed it to rain. Now, why? Once again, he prayed in faith. He prayed fervently. And then we see here in verse 18 that he prayed with consistency and, pers and uh, persistency. So if we're going to summarize this, he prayed faithfully. He prayed in faith. He prayed frequently. And he, excuse me, he prayed faithfully. He prayed fervently. And he prayed frequently. In verse 18, it says, and he prayed again. That means that it wasn't just a one-time prayer. He didn't pray it a couple times and then just stop praying. This indicates that Elijah had a life that was marked by consistent and persistent prayer. And that led to effective prayer that actually changed things and changed the, the landscape, really. Of not only his, his own personal life, but the, the entire landscape of his nation. So I want to think about this as we, th we think about the test of prayerfulness in our own lives. What are the issues that you're going through right now? Because James lays it out here, whether we're afflicted, whether we're merry, whether we're sick, he gives us the instruction of how we should be responding to those situations that we, and circumstances in our lives. If we are praying right now, are we praying 
faithfully? Are we praying in faith, as we see here? Are we praying with fervency? Are we praying frequently? Is our life, is our prayer life specifically, marked by faithfulness, fervency, and frequency? Are we praying constantly with constant fervor, persistent, um, calling out to the Lord with urgency and expecting, expecting him to answer our prayers? If, we, if we're not praying with faith, if we're not praying with fervent, fervently, if we're not praying consistently and persistently, frequently, we're not really going to expect much from our prayers. And if we really want to change um, really our entire spiritual walk, I mean, if we really believe that, that prayer changes things, think of how much can be changed if by simply praying faith, praying in faith, without doubting, expecting God to, to, to answer our prayers, praying fervently with urgency really means to being on fire. Later on in the New Testament, it talks about the earth is going to melt with a fervent heat. That means an overflowing hot heat. So if I was going to ask you this way, how hot are your prayers? What is the temperature of your prayer life? Are you, are you mediocre? Or are you on fire in your prayer life for the Lord? We see in Revelation, the, the temperature of the Laodicean church, they were lukewarm. Not much was getting done because they weren't that fired up. If you want your prayers to be more effective, get fired up. Get fervent when you pray. Um, and, and lastly, how frequently are you praying? Now, I'm glad you're joining us tonight for a prayer meeting. But if you're only praying with us and really making a special note of emphasis of praying on Wednesday nights, you're not, you shouldn't really expect you know, as much to be happening in your prayer life as you probably should. But if you're praying in faith every single day, if you're praying um, on fire every single day, every time you come to the Lord, you are impassioned about it. You are, you are emotional about it. You are urgent about it. You are anticipating. You are expecting him to answer prayer. God tells us he will respond to that. The, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth, much. It will avail. It will bring about change. But you have to be praying in faith. You have to be praying fervently, and you have to be praying frequently. Okay, if you're someone who kind of jumps in and out of prayer, and you go through seasons when you pray a little bit, and then you don't pray for a while, you pray a lot, you're on fire, and you don't pray for a while, don't expect that your prayer life as a whole is going to produce that much results. But if you really want to um, grow in your spiritual walk, you want to see God do something in your life and through your life, you have to answer this test of prayerfulness. Are you praying faithfully? Are you praying fervently? And are you praying frequently? This is the most important thing that will make the biggest change in your life that you can possibly do. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in just a minute for prayer meeting. And when we do come together to pray tonight, let's not forget this as we pray here in just a few minutes. Let's pray in faith. Let's expect God to answer prayers. Let's anticipate that God already knows our needs and that he's waiting to respond to us as we ask him. Let's pray with fervency. Let's pray with some emotion. Pray with some passion. And once we pray tonight, don't forget about these requests. Pray over the, 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 our prayer requests. Keep them at the forefront of your mind. Pray fervently about them frequently until we meet again. Thank you and see you in just a few minutes.